All right, folks, this morning we are going to talk about uh, Gateway's Learning Success uh, Center and the tutoring services that are offered at the Learning Success Center. Now, I, I know that here, you know, on the Gateway website, I came in here and I did just a quick search on tutoring and, and came up with this uh, page. But you'll notice that the tutoring page is under a section called Learning Success. And, you know, the there's kind of like a negative connotation, right? So whenever you say the word tutoring, it's like, oh, wow, you don't know what you're doing. So you're going to get tutoring, you know, um, which is one way to look at it. And, and, you know, and maybe in some ways, maybe that's kind of an accurate representation. But at, on the other hand, sometimes people just struggle with, let's say, the mechanics of like how you're doing something or the process of how you do IT assignments. You know, it's not like in a, uh, a thing that you've been doing your whole life. So when you get like programming exercises, for example, and all you get is like a verbal description and you're supposed to convert that into code somehow, it, you know, raises the stress level for sure, uh, especially until you get that flow going. And I think that what's interesting about the Learning Success Center is, you know, they, they don't call it, you know, the name of the, the part of the organization is not, you know, um, where, you, where you go to get help. <laughs> you know, that's not what they call it. They call it learning su success because they really want you to be successful in, in the whole endeavor of this, you know, so the spin is on the positive. Now, where do we have learning success centers? We have them at each one of our major campus locations. So Gateway has one major campus in each county. And so there's uh, the Kenosha main campus, uh, which is on uh, 30th Street in Kenosha, and then the downtown campus in Racine, and then the uh, campus in Elkhorn are all uh, the main campuses in their area. And if you didn't know this, you know the Gateway Technical College system does cover all three of those counties. So it's Racine, Kenosha, and Walworth County, although we do pull students in from even beyond that range. So um, I think that's pretty fascinating when you start, start to think about how uh, big Gateway is, and those aren't our only facilities, but each one of those major campus locations, basically the same campus locations that have libraries and bookstores and student services offices, and um, all those you know, primary services also have the Learning Success Center. Now, if you ever get a chance to go on campus when things kind of return back to like, you know, quote unquote normal, I would always encourage you to just stop in there someday and just, you know, poke your head in and look around. And usually what you're gonna see is this big open space with lots of places to sit, lots of computers and people to help you. Um, uh, tables that are out in the open, tables that are in cubicles, uh, some are privatized rooms. Some of the rooms have projection systems, so you can do team uh, work in those areas. Um, and you can just walk in there to any campus location. I think you have to show your ID um, and you can sit down and just do your work. You, know, you don't even have to ask anybody for help. However, if you got stuck with something, you could say, hey, you know, I was working through my math and I got stuck on you know, factoring this polynomial. Do you have anybody here that might be able to help me look at this? And you'd be surprised more often than not, they will, and they'll help you out just like that. Now, it's usually better, though, if you are going to go to the Learning Success Center with the intent of being tutored, to actually do it on a schedule. So what I uh, suggest to people is, you know, call ahead. And in this day and age, um, since we're, you know, in pandemic mode and, and visiting in person is a little bit um, not <laughs> recommended, I guess. Um, they also have a virtual uh, session. So just like we're doing the Zoom session this morning, um, they do their tutoring services through an online interface. I, I think they, they use Zoom just like we do and, um, and do the sessions in that manner. Now, this page here kind of details what the, the department does. And you'll notice they have their little disclaimer here due to the virus and, and all that. Um, and, you know, what their current status is, I believe they're still in all online mode. Um, there are some classes that are happening on campus this summer, believe it or not, uh, but only ones that are absolutely critical that have to be face-to-face. -face. 
Um, that, fortunately, that's not us for right now, but I think I'm getting the impression that by fall, uh, at least, I guess I'm kind of crossing my fingers that we're gonna be fully back on campus and back to normal. Um, um, well, well, whatever the new normal is. So I was, I was kind of preface that. I don't know how uh, we'll enforce social distancing in the classroom or if you get into a class where every seat is full, how that's gonna be handled, but I guess we'll see when we get there. Um, it seems to me going out and about in public and seeing people at the stores and the beach and, and I guess marching down the street holding signs, uh, there's not a lot of social distancing going on out there right now and a lot, a lot of people seem to be concerned about masks. So maybe that will be a factor too. But let's, let's take a look uh, really quick at the virtual uh, tutoring schedule that they have online here. And, you know, I, I know that as part of what I ask you to do in some of the units in this, uh, in this course is to kind of look at some of the resources that Gateway has, and, and this is one. And I'm gonna tell you what, I think this is a huge resource. And um, I think I probably mentioned it already, so if, if I sound like a broken record, I guess that's a little bit my intent. Uh, but sometimes I also forget which stories I tell uh, which group of people. So um, what I've seen with a, a lot of students, and, and I get people that come into these programs that have significant skill when they come in. So for example, you know, like, like Lisa, you're talking about all the CSS work you already do, you know, professionally, basically for pay. And um, you're, you're not alone. So I, I get people that are already out there coding or working in IT, or they're working in a different aspect of IT and want to kind of shift positions. And so they come and they get their credentials, sharpen their skills, and then, uh, you know, kind of hit the ground running with what they're already doing. Um, I also get that contingency of people that come in that have been longtime IT professionals. And you're going to see this as a, as a commonality once you get out into the field, is that people that are really good at IT have this tendency to take courses all the time. Like in some cases, I get students that will take, make sure they take one course every semester. They're not even working on a degree. They're just taking courses because they just want to keep learning and because they're just naturally intrigued and fascinated by all this stuff. And you know, and that's kind of the category that I fell into personally. It, it, it's like the interest of technology pulled me into the computer field. Um, and you know, maybe you're one of those people that, you know, it's like maybe you got into computing because you liked gaming and then maybe you built a computer system and then maybe that started leading to tinkering with some code and all of a sudden, you're like, hey, code is kind of cool. What more can I do with it? And so here you are sitting here talking with me. <laughs> and uh, I, I do almost sometimes get the converse. And the converse is people that have come into my classes and okay, all right, everybody, right click on, you know, whatever, right? And very sincere, this is, and, and even though it sounds like a joke, it's like, is, is there a wrong click, <laughs> you know? or how do I right click, uh, you know, or how do I copy paste the real, you know, fundamentals of, you know, operating a computer and people struggle, you know, and, and I'll tell you what, this is um, partially due to a couple of different things. So young people, for example, um, you know, and, I, and I'm looking at people who are, you know, pretty fresh out of, out of high school, for example, that are, might be in this program. Um, I look at you as I look at my children, right? So my children, um, who are probably about your age or real close, um, did not grow up in a world without internet. They did not grow up in a world without uh, technology in their hand from a really, really young age um, and don't even understand um, the world that came before. You know, like, you know, I always kind of chuckle. It's like everybody's got a smartphone and all this technology, but they still manage to not talk to each other. Where in the old days, we just had a landline and they seem to have more meaningful conversations at the same time, or at least we're better at planning uh, things out over you know one single phone call. It seems, um, but that that mindset of you know, if especially if you see people who are in my age category, so you know, so I'm like, you know, well into my my middle age and and, and graying, but I I see it with my peers that I have a certain contingency of my you know people my same age that have either completely embraced technology, so they have the smartphone and the computer and they're online all the time, and maybe they do it for work or whatever. And then I also have a contingency of people in my age group that are like, 
all right, I got a phone, but that's like that, that's pushing it. You know, I really, you know, I don't want to be online. People are going to snoop me. I'm going to get a virus. I'm afraid, you know, whatever the case is. And we work with those kind of um, predispositions, right? So when you really are confronted with a computer to do an actual task, you know, a functional task, aside from like Facebook, you don't know what to do, right? So it takes coaching to kind of get into the mindset of what our children or younger generation are kind of doing intuitively. They just like absorb it because it's like, oh, or here you go, dad, click, 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 click. And, and we got it. Right. <laughs> and so, it, you know, those of you that are, um, you know, older like me know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, I mean, here I am an IT guy and my, my children think they're showing me a thing or two about computers. Right. So, um, <laughs> and in some cases, you know, they are, you know, cause they just have a different experience. Um, but how do you, how do you, like, if you're not in that mindset with the young person, how do you get into that mindset? And some of it is, like I said, the workflow. And what you do is you go visit these tutors, folks. They will help you get into that workflow. Um, so what I would ask you to do is really carefully look at these and notice when IT is offered. So you notice how there's time frames here. And then every once in a while, you know, IT is offered. Um, and so I think that many of these, I think uh, the 1.30 to 4.30 are, are sessions that Erin told me that she's available for. Um, and so she's actually housed in Elkhorn. So when she is giving your tutoring session, you would be connecting with her there. If um, you were looking at some of the other time slots, I think some of those would hit the Kenosha Learning Success Center and some would hit the Racine. Um, but you just look, look at the time slot that you're uh, available for, see if the thing that you're looking for, you know, that's the little key for you guys, is offered, and then go ahead and click to join. And I believe that all of these, and, and I might be being a little brave here, I think all of these are, yeah, they're all Zoom sessions. So if, if I click on this, I might end up inside somebody else's Zoom session, and I'm not sure how they do this, if they do it one-on-one, -on -one, or they have little breakout rooms where they isolate people into whatever, because um, frankly, I haven't done it. But what I've seen as a byproduct of this, and the reason I push it so heavily, so I've seen people come in, and um, I had one older guy that, you know, and I say older, you know, my age, basically, who came in not knowing a darn thing really about computers. Not that, that he couldn't use one, but he really didn't know it on a technical level. I knew that he was struggling because when he was saving his files, he couldn't find it. He's like, he'd save a file and he couldn't find anything in the aftermath. I'm like, where'd you save it? He goes, on the computer. <laughs> you know, that, that's, the, that, that's the answer. Well, yeah, but where on the computer, right? So, um, and just that, you know, that, that's a pretty important thing, knowing where your files are, especially if you have to turn it in for a grade. And so I saw uh, this guy and his name was Tom. Uh, and, and Tom, and I said, Tom, you know, I. I think that you can totally do this job, but I think you need a little bit of guidance and support beyond what I can do for you in the classroom or like little one-on-one -on -one meetings you would have for him. And so I suggested to him, like, start going to see the tutors and see if you can get on a weekly schedule. So he did. And in fact, he ended up going to see the tutors twice a week. He was a full-time student. Um, and oh my God, what a difference, you know? So, you know, first few months, still a little rough. By the time he got like two semesters down the road, he was showing me things, you know, so I think that the, the turnaround was amazing. Um, he went from not feeling confident and, and clearly not knowing what he's doing to being not only competent, uh, but very capable. And it's just really a matter of seeing the patterns, you know, of how to proceed with your work. So um, I think for whatever it's worth, the tutoring programs that we have here are really strong. Um, they, they are no cost to you as a student. They're, they're, these are just services that are available. And there's a high correlation with people who regularly go to the Learning Success Center when they feel challenged and uh, success in the program. So the, the people that really tend to be regularly successful uh, tend to be those that have that regular workflow. Now I do get, you know, the, the young people who get it and don't need the support and that's fantastic. 
um, and maybe it's because you understand technology, but sometimes even if you understand technology, you might not be understanding the procedural aspect of what you're doing. And so when I see younger students going to the Learning Success Center, it's because maybe they're not good about keeping up on their homework, right? Like they get how the computer works and how to do the stuff, but give them a due date and they don't, they don't get it, right? So, because they don't have like, for example, the pressure of paying rent, you know, that kind of thing. Um, or understanding that college is, is more um, serious than high school. So, uh, and that's, uh, and for me, I'll tell you what, that, that's a big thing um, that I saw with my son. So my son, when he was in high school, um, and I blame a little bit of it on Montessori upbringing, I, I guess, because when you're in grade school, they didn't really have to turn in work. They would just have to pass their tests. And if they could score high in English, for example, they were like, okay, you're good. Um, but it taught them nothing about the work ethic of doing something on a regular basis. And in college, it's really, really important that you do your work on time and turn it in and do the stuff that your instructor is asking you. Every instructor will be different. Everybody will have different expectations. Some will be lenient, and I, I tend to, to be more on that side of things. Um, and some will be particularly harsh in their grading. Um, and unforgiving. So like you miss a due date, they turn off the assignment. They're like, oh, well, you had your chance to turn it in. That's too late now. <laughs> and they, they'll look you straight in the face like that and, and tell you, you know, tough luck. Um, now, I'm not like of that mindset myself, but I see the value of that. So, um, you know, discipline is good, but I think um, working with people is good too. So please, uh, if you guys are struggling in any way, shape or form, I would strongly uh, suggest that you either um, jump into one of these sessions and sign up or give them a call and ask about how it works. Um, I don't know what the regular business hours are. Um, okay, so these are the virtual hours, but like when the campus is back in full swing, I think they keep some pretty long hours. And the one thing that I also tell people is whenever I visit a different campus, so if I, you know, I'm, I'm located at the Racine campus and if I and let's say down in Kenosha for some meetings or activities, um, which I often get invited to and you need a place to just sit down and work that's quiet. The Learning Success Center is where I go. Um, I just grab either one of their private rooms or a table and just pull up a spot there. Um, and I've also seen a, a number of instructors, I, I'm not sure that our IT people do this so much, but some instructors will also hold their office hours at the Learning Success Center. And that tends to be more people teaching gen ed topics such as like you know math and english and you know psychology and stuff like that um <clears throat> now if you guys ever need to meet with me and, and and charlie and i like charlie and i had like what i call a traditional office hour session you know where uh, i take a a portion of like my time uh, and one-on-one -on -one with you so if you get in a situation where you need that kind of support it's not an embarrassment um now, Jay, you've already graduated with me, and you and I would do that fairly often. I mean, you'd get stuck on something, um, and we'd share the line together and work through it. And I, I always thought we we did a good job of that, and and it helps, right? Yeah, it was it was very helpful. Right, and that wasn't even that, and that's not even technically tutoring. That's just the office hours, and. All right. You know, sometimes, you know, if we're in class and, and it's kind of what happened with, with Charlie the other day is like the problem that you run into in class maybe is significant enough where it's like kind of throwing the, the whole session off track, right? And, and in that case, that's when I usually jump in and I go, you know what, we need, we need to set up a one-on-one -on -one, um, to work through this uh, rather than do what everybody already knows how to do. And, and that way you'll get more out of it and they'll get more out of it. So I always kind of balance. Right. I think I think it talks enough about um, this particular topic. And what I'd like to do now is move on um, to unit four and look at the content here. And and I think um, as you guys come into this program, this I'm, I'm hoping at least this is one of the 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 questions that you've asked yourself, right? So now some people will come to this program because they know exactly what a full stack web developer is. And um, they want to become that. And you know, the program that we've designed here this summer, the, the bootcamp accelerated version, is designed to get you 
up and running as fast as possible. But what the heck is a full stack developer? So we have this little article that we've linked up here. Um, and now notice the, the date on this. So this is not a new concept. So people were calling this a full stack developer back in 2017. Now we are now in 2023 years down the road, but the definition really uh, hasn't changed. So they have this, this article here and this uh, article just talks about what is it particularly about the technologies that we're learning that make you uh, a full stack developer. So I think this is a really well written article. And you know, see like these little testimonials and stuff. Um, but let's kind of just rifle through this really quick. And, um, and it's not to like kind of maybe teach you something new for some of you it might not be and for some of you it might be completely eye opening. Right. So I, the, the crux of what a full stack developer really is what's written in this first sentence here, basically. A full stack developer is someone who is able to work on both the front end and back end portions of an application. And I want you to notice that they're not using the word website either. They're calling what we do on the screen, you know, basically an application. Now, we are starting with our HTML class, creating what I call static web pages. Um, and generally speaking, I wouldn't call those applications. And, and the, the, really, the, the, for me, the differentiating point is, are you using code just to put something on the screen? Or are you using code to programmatically put something on the screen? And the word programmatic implies that there's some sort of a process happening in the background, whether uh, it's a step-by-step, -step, you know, do this, do this, do this process, for example, like um, you go to a website, you log in, and once you log in, you see different stuff on the screen. That would be a step-by-step. -step. Or um, are you uh, maybe performing certain actions on the screen, or are you a certain group of user, in which case it looks at your qualifications and gives you different stuff on the screen. But whenever you start to do any programming on the back end, where decisions are made or certain actions are taken that are beyond the user's control where there's programming, then I think we're transitioning away from a static web page to what we call an application um, and basically a piece of software. So now, even though the piece of software basically that we're creating is inside of a computer browser, does not make it any less valid than a piece of software that runs natively on your operating system. Like if you went down here and launched Microsoft Word just as an example, as opposed to pulling up a web page. But if you think about how we operate computers now, like in the old days, for example, if I wanted to do email, I would go to my email program. I would open an email program that would connect up my email and I could do email. Now, how do we do email? Think about that. We just do it right through our web browser. Very few people are operating separate email programs. And uh, regardless though, What's, whatever's happening on your screen is being driven by an application. In this case, it would be a web application. So understanding that concept, I think, is really pivotal, right? So the other thing is understanding the differentiation between what we call front end and back end. So the front end what is what I would call all the stuff that happens in the browser that the user can see. So like any page that I go to, if I find an open spot on the page and do a right click and then bring up this page source, pull, pull it up on the screen, and you see like this like gibber of code here that you're like, oh my God, I'll never understand it. And you know, chances are I probably would never understand that code either. It looks very messy. <laughs> but um, the, the truth is actually, yes, you can. And the code that we were just looking at is what I call front end code. So it's the code that ends up in the browser and, and what the user interacts with. So what they see on the screen and what they're interacting with is what we'd call the front end. The back end would be the code that they could never see. So the code that's running on the server that's making the application run. So that could be database connections, programming logic. Uh, you might do something on the front end that triggers an application on the back end that does a specific task and then feeds information back to your browser window. Um, and what happened in, in the past, especially with web, is web was not as powerful 
um, a couple of decades ago in terms of backend programming. Not that it wasn't happening, but it was very minimal. These days, it's expected as a web person that you understand how to work the front end and how to work the back end, at least to a small degree. In the old days, when you would learn this discipline, you would just learn the front end skill. You would just learn HTML and CSS and a smidgen of JavaScript. But really, you weren't writing an application. You were just putting stuff on the screen, and you were a front end person. So most web people were front end people. But we've heard this cry from industry as technologies have become more sophisticated, as applications require databases to store information, that the back end programming in many cases is equally, if not more important, uh, and more in demand. And, and the people that tend to have the back end skills, meaning program, like traditional programming skills um, and traditional database skills, those, those two in particular, um, can earn quite a high wage, right? Because those are a little bit more specialized tasks. You're not just putting something visual on the screen, you're, you're putting it on the screen and you're making it do something and you're the person that's making it do the magic, right? You know, what, you know, like Facebook is cool and everything, but how do they get all that stuff up on the screen? Who's doing that programming? Those are the brilliant people um, that are doing it. Now, if you can combine the skills, that's what we call a full stack developer. And there's a, there's a different type of value um, in that. So if you can look at a project holistically, so you understand how to make the front end look great and you understand how to make the back end go, then you really have something very marketable that you can take out there uh, and hire. So let's say that, that you're on that track and, and what are the skills um, that you would learn as a person? Well, we start with HTML and CSS and those are the, tr the two mainstays of the front end. So what people see on the screen, all right? Uh, from there we go to JavaScript and, and JavaScript is, um, basically the programming language of our web browsers. Um, it can operate, uh, or traditionally it would operate only in the browser. So you would send the code to the browser and the browser would operate it on the person's machine. What has happened with JavaScript though, it has now become a backend language as well, which is when we talk about full stack, um, that's um, what's become important. So here, here they talk about backend languages now, mind you, this is slightly dated. This, these are dated from 2016, and I think there's been some adjustment to like these numbers probably. But they talk about um, the languages that operate in the back end of applications and you know, ranked by the number of jobs available in that field. And I want you guys to notice that right at the top of this list is this thing called SQL, which is all about databases. So what, what this is telling you is there's more jobs in database programming on the back end than any of these other languages. And that is a trend that I think continues. So in other words, having an application that you can put on the screen and have it do stuff, that's great. Tying it to a data source so it can read and store information, um, even more important. And um, and I, I think maybe I gave you guys the adage once that I, you know, I, one of my cousins married a, a programmer, right? And he was a contract guy. He would always do the contract work. And he says, man, I'm glad I learned databases because I'll, I'll never go hungry, you know? And um, <laughs> it is so true. If you were a database only person, you could make some huge money. Um, in fact, my predecessor that um, taught here at Gateway and, and was a department chair, she was uh, one of the head database people down at uh, m and uh, in Milwaukee. And, and if you guys can fathom this, like well, well over two decades ago was, uh, making well into the six, six figure range doing that job and retired from it and then came and taught at Gateway. Um, so, uh, in, and so people will pay really big money for people with, with strong skills in databases. Now moving past that, you see a number of different uh, programming languages. And I think what's interesting about these is we've taught every one of these uh, at one point or another. Ruby on Rails is one that we've now retired, but we used to teach. And iOS used to be taught by our software program, but otherwise the, the web program currently will teach you basically almost all the rest of these. The exception would be C++, but C++ uh, is really easy to pick up once you learn Java and C Sharp. 
In fact, that's more the parent language for those languages uh, than the other way around. But we teach you Java in this program. We teach you JavaScript in this program. We teach you C-sharp once you get into the full uh, two-year degree. It doesn't happen in the full stack. Um, you also learn the Python language if you're in the full degree as well. And then PHP, you learn in the full degree and in um, the tech diploma, the one-year degree. It's also not part of the full stack. In the old days when we would do, uh, you know, uh, application development, we would office, often build on a different type of stack that we would call the LAMP stack. In fact, uh, let me uh, just type that in as a search. Um, so, and you can read what the description is here, but basically what, what it implies is a combination of technologies. And I, I think maybe this image here kind of tells you what, what the technologies are, which is you build on top of a Linux operating system. Apache is the web server that serves out the pages. MySQL is the database and PHP is the, the coding language. And so um, a lot of the world's website infrastructure is built on that technology. And up until I'm gonna say five years ago, it was the predominant web development platform. In, in other words, this, this suite of technologies. Now, most of us developers don't really concern ourselves with these two because it's just an operating system and it's just a web server software. However, the database, MySQL and PHP, were seen like the kind of like the open source uh, tools that kind of built the, the web 2.0 world that we live in. In other words, the interactive social media world really owe a lot to these two technologies. In fact, uh, like Mark Zuckerberg built Facebook, you know, as a kind of like a school project kind of thing, using those two technologies, a traditional database and PHP. Now, what's happened in the interim, though, is as people were learning how to code and they would learn JavaScript, they would say, well, now I got to learn PHP too, you know, you know, and that, okay, that's a server side language and that's great because it gives me some power, but wouldn't it be cool if we could just do JavaScript on the, on the back end? And so what's happened is they've developed this technology called Node.js. And this is the primary uh, JavaScript backend framework. So this is a technology that runs on the server that you connect to. And you write JavaScript code that runs on the back end on the server. And that's kind of a new thought. So instead of having to learn another language, what they kind of had determined is, well, if you already know JavaScript, why don't we find a way to make JavaScript on the server? And then you only have to know one language to do front end and back end programming. And that was uh, kind of the big thing. So when you guys get to the web programming two class later on in this full stack certificate, you will be working with uh, Node.js and a number of other different uh, technologies and frameworks. But this is kind of the big one um, in my mind. Um, so, talk about databases and web storage, so like you know, where to store your stuff. Um, I, I do want, want you to understand that, that when you do learn databases in, in our program, that we teach relational databases and the, the SQL language. And now in this full stack program, so if you're taking the full stack certificate, we do not have a database course built in. All right, um, that comes into full tech diploma or two-year degree. So in those degree paths, you actually take one full course in database, and then you'll start getting databases peppered into almost all of your classes. In the full stack program, we decided instead to lean a different direction, which is a trend that we're seeing with full stack development, and that is uh, what we call these NoSQL databases, with probably the best example being this thing called MongoDB. And so if you take the Web Programming 2 class, uh, Christian will be talking about how this works. Um, and th the emphasis on the MongoDB, I think, predominantly is that you don't necessarily have to learn your traditional query language programming uh, to operate it. And it's, and it's pretty lightweight and portable. So in other words, you kind of attach the databases to your projects and can move them around. Um, and because most web designers only need very simple information placed on their web pages, you know, so in other words, you're, you're storing simple, simple things and retrieving simple things. The MongoDB and the NoSQL databases are 
often ideal for simple web applications. Um, and so that that's a really, really um, huge thing that's developed. So this has grown in prominence too. So it's part of our full stack training, um, uh, but not like the same as taking a full database course, but you do get introduced to it a little bit. I will tell you though, if you wanna become a big professional developer, having database knowledge becomes you know, as fundamental as, I don't know, I guess if you want to walk, tying your shoes so you don't trip, you know, so <laughs> it's something you eventually will want to learn on, on some level. Uh, the other thing that they talk about is what we call HTTP and, and REST, and REST is actually an architectural style for building web uh, pages, and, and when we build applications, that we call them RESTful, um, and, and what that means is basically they allow you to do things on screen and interact with the user without actually necessarily changing the screen. So, and I think always a good example is like, if you're like looking at email, uh, for example, um, this is an application that Google runs and anytime I click on a message, and I'm careful to click on one that's an ad here, right? The, the screen did not redraw. All that happened is via this technology called Ajax, this part of the screen talked to the server, pulled my messages from some sort of a database, and then refreshed only that part of the screen while the rest of the screen stayed the way it was. And that approach is part of like the REST approach and what we call the RESTful API. And that's enabled a lot of the stuff that we do online. So if you think of like how like Facebook operates, uh, especially on a computer, a proper computer, um, where you know, you can look at people's comments and you can see interactivity happening. And your screen's not being refreshed. It's happening all in the background because there's applications running in the background through the REST API that are talking back and forth with the server, changing things on your screen without reloading your page. And that really, when you're at that level, you really do have an application running in your window. Um, it's not uh, it's no longer a web page, folks. I mean, it still looks like a web page, but it's really an application. Um, understanding how all these things kind of connect together. Now, that doesn't come quickly, by the way. This is something you learn over time, and it takes a little bit of time to understand how computers all interact, how they connect together. Um, and often when we're building applications, and, and the reason that they, they show this um, Amazon Web Services, and I, and I always tell this to people, it's like, you know, Amazon's the world's biggest retailer, right? In fact, they sell so much retail that they make, you know, Walmart look like a mom and pop um, by comparison. And, um, but retail operations is not the biggest part of their business. And that, and that typically will astound people. In fact, the thing that they generate their, most of their revenue from is this division called Amazon Web Services. So what happens is a lot of people when they build applications and they decide to deploy them to the public will use the Amazon infrastructure to do so. So what does that mean? Well, when Amazon built their organization, they realized, well, hey, you know, we're gonna need a bunch of computers to run all this stuff. So what they did is instead of building what they need, they significantly overbuilt their infrastructure with the intent of selling the, the computer capability on a lease basis to anybody who needs it. So like a lot of companies, when they build an application and deploy it to the public and launch it, will often turn to Amazon Web Services to deploy their applications. In other words, they, they, they buy the server space from Amazon to dish out whatever they're doing, whether it's a website or an app or whatever. Um, and that's where Amazon generates most of its revenue. Now, if you think about that and you think about how big they are as a retailer, it's like, wow, do they have a lot of people posting their stuff on Amazon? Absolutely. In fact, it's, it's estimated that most of the major applications that we use, aside from the Google and Microsoft world, typically are housed on Amazon Web Services somewhere. Um, and that's the biggest aspect of their business. And isn't that kind of a weird thing? I, I don't know. I think that's kind of a weird thing to think about. And then we got this thing called Git. Uh, all right, so, all right, so Git makes it sound like get out of here, right? <laughs> but Git is actually a service recently purchased by Microsoft, and it's actually called GitHub. Um, right here, this is the spelling. And GitHub is basically a code repository and sharing system. So, in other words, you can set up an account on the service 
where you learn to store your code. And um, then by virtue of storing it there, you have a safe spot. So in other words, instead of like storing it on your own machine, you could store it in Git. And then if you want to share that code with somebody else or distribute your application, you just simply give people a link to your GitHub repository. Now, more than just being a spot to store files, GitHub is also what we call a version versioning system. And you're going to hear that probably from me more as you kind of move through this course. But when you start working on a piece of software or an application, often what happens is you're, you've gotten up to a certain point and you're, you're on to the next step. But sometimes when you're taking that next step, there's the potential of screwing up the whole thing, right? So like you could blow up the code and, and lose all your work. What versioning is, is where you take snapshots in, in, in time. So in other words, well, it's, it's looking good so far, so I have this version of it. So I'm gonna try something new, but I wanna keep this version. So version control is basically a way of keeping each version of something that you do. So if you do step forward and blow something up, you can step backwards. Now, Git is owned by Microsoft, but it didn't always used to be that way. And um, for some people, and I, I tell students, especially if they're heavy on, on programming, that you should create a GitHub account for yourself and you should upload examples of your work to GitHub. And in some coding um, offices around the world, they'll look at your GitHub repository just to make a determination on whether or not they're gonna hire you. It's like, does this, this person even know what Git is? Oh, well, yeah, look, they got an account. They got all their work is here. Great, great, they get it. All right, we'll hire them. Um, and now we don't teach Git very heavily in our program, usually because we just don't have enough time, but it's not like it, it's very difficult. You can go to GitHub and set up a free account and you can connect it to most major IDEs. So like if you guys get to the point where you're using Visual Studio, for example, that has the ability to save your work directly to GitHub, um, as do a lot of other systems, although you can always do it manually. So that's considered kind of like a, a really important thing and versioning control, of course, is uh, a thing. Learning um, about algorithms and data structures is pretty important and that's really a topic that gets more into advanced programming. Um, but people that learn how you know, computer code when bundled together as a construct forms patterns and they start to see those patterns. And then more importantly, for those of you studying data analytics, um, how that interacts with data. So we're moving into a very data heavy uh, aspect of society right now where we're generating so much data and we need people that can monitor it. So understanding how data structures work are important. Um, when I formally studied what I called uh, data structures, it was, uh, I believe it was in my, um, it wasn't in my undergrad program, I think it was in my graduate program. And, and all they do in there is talk about methods for organizing data on a code level, basically. So that, that's what data structure is. And so that, that, that's kind of like a, an overview from this article, and I think the article is still pretty valid. And so, folks, really the point of this unit here is um, how do you become this, right? Because now that you know what it is and you can define it, then you start to identify the things you actually have to learn to become a full stack developer. So I have a, uh, an interesting list of resources here. These were originally developed by Wendy, one of our other instructors. So she has a lot of these detailed on this link here. So if you follow that link. But uh, we kind of as a department went through and started um, making this list of like websites that we like to use and our students like to use to learn how to do web stuff. And so you will see on this list, of course, W3 schools is kind of a, a no brainer, uh, but we kind of put them into categories. So if you get a chance, um, I would suggest kind of at least perusing all of these different sites. And there's ones that I like better than others. Um, some of them offer full-blown courses. Some of them are troubleshooting sites. Some of them are reference sites or combinations. Um, now, I haven't gone quite into like the LinkedIn learning and lynda.com thing too heavily. I think I demonstrated it a little bit a couple weeks ago, but I think that's an excellent repository. I think this Code Academy uh, is really good. Uh, another one that I use is one called Free Code Camp. 
um, that you guys can check out. But the assignment in this um, unit here, there's, there's two assignments and I wanna kind of explain them both. The first one is hopefully read through, check out those articles, do your own research, and then answer these questions. So what's a full stack developer? What skills do they have? Um, and what do you have as concerns about a career in web development after reading all that? Because that's a lot to absorb, right? Um, and so that's the question I asked just to see where your head's at basically. Um, and then perhaps give you some guidance in, in terms of where you're moving. All right, so that's a lot. I know that's a lot to absorb in a short period of time. And I'm sorry, I, I do wanna talk about um, this assignment and, and you guys are gonna see that we're gonna be doing this little uh, wiki assignment. Now, first of all, let's talk about what the term wiki even means. Now, when I, whenever you see that word, what most people immediately think is Wikipedia. It's like, oh yeah, that's the best source for information, right? And then you discover all your teachers say, hey, don't use Wikipedia as a source for any of your papers. Um, and does anybody know why you shouldn't use Wikipedia as a source? All right, well, let, let me answer it. All right, okay, I got a couple people unmuting. Who wants to go first? I have, Lisa, go ahead. It can be changed and edited by anyone. It will later be fixed by other people most likely, but the fact is it can always be changed and edited by anybody. Yeah, and, and, and Lisa, you're right, right about that. It is possible that anybody that has an account with that service can go in there and change any article. And sometimes you'll see people kind of maliciously doing that to each other where they, like somebody puts in what they call a fact and then somebody comes in and changes it because they, they say it's not a fact. But a lot of the content now on Wikipedia is moderated. But I always tell people Wikipedia is still a good source of information, but the, the real key to it is to find the references. So if somebody says a really key piece of information saying this is the way it is, and they give you the link from where the info came from, go, go to where it came from. Uh, so that in that way, it's kind of helpful. All right. But in terms of what we're doing here, you're going to get to the point when you're learning this stuff, you're going to start to get overwhelmed with all the information that you're gathering, especially at the beginning, right? So you're, you're learning all these languages, you're learning all this software, and then what do you do? Okay, so like the old school approach, and, and uh, kind of like the world I came from, I guess is kind of the way it, I look at it. It was pencil and paper. Hey, I'm in the classroom, somebody's saying something, that I'm writing it down. Now, believe it or not, just the act of writing something down, and even if you never go back and look at it, is some sort of a magic serum. You know, it, It's been proven time and time again through research and study that even if you don't look at your notes, the act of writing your notes down helps you to remember because there's like a physical action attached to it, right? Now, electronically, you kind of don't have that same ability, right? So what you might start doing is start using tools. And, and this is um, why I call this assignment what I do, like tools for keeping it straight. So in other words, how are you keeping track of all this stuff and how are you chronicling this information? My, my guess would be if you are even working electronically to capture that information, you're probably not using very optimal tools. So for example, if you're listening to me right now and you're taking notes, you might be writing it on paper or maybe maybe you just bring up your, uh, your notepad or your notepad plus plus and I'm, and I'm bringing that up. Um, and you know, you know, Ty says, you know, dot, 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 um, you know, you know, HTML this and, and CSS that, right? Um, just, you know, taking notes. And, and for primitive as it is, some people do take notes this way. And, and frankly, it can be effective, right? Now, I would suggest that you probably use a little bit more powerful program than Notepad++, but I'll tell you what, as long as you can capture the info, you're capturing the info. There are more sophisticated tools, though. And I want to point out a few of them. So the one thing that you can do is you can go to tr traditional document editor or a spreadsheet to organize your information. Now, um, we are in a subsequent session, we are gonna go through the different office suites. So I don't wanna kind of blow all that thunder, 
but you should always remember that with your email accounts, you can always go to this Google Apps menu up here with the little waffle icon, and you can pull down the Google Drive, or you could just go right to Docs or Sheets, right, and create a document, and just start taking, you know, taking your notes here. Right? That's one thing that you can do. Google does have this other really neat tool, though, that you should be aware of, and you might have to go hunting for it a little bit in the stuff, but they have this thing called Keep. And Keep is a note-taking application, and you can see I have uh, a Google Keep here. And basically, they're kind of like little post-it notes of sorts where you can put in like images and links. And what I do is sometimes I'm at a meeting or something, uh, and I most often use this, uh, honestly, when I usually don't have my laptop with me and I'm just on the phone and I need to capture a piece of information quickly. So I'll, I'll bring this up and you can see like right here, um, it says take a note. Um, and then I, I close it and then it just kind of pops in the board here. And of course, that once it's here, you can move it around, delete it, color it, style it, whatever you want to do. But if you're just capturing a, just a quick little piece of information, you can see for me often it's just like a link to something. Um, this is great because I, I didn't have anywhere to write it down and now I have to go somewhere else. So I just close my tab, but it's attached to my gateway account. So when I come back, it'll be there. So this is one tool I use uh, for keeping things straight. Another one that I've used um, and recommend and, and I, ha I wasn't a huge fan of this app when it first came out, and it's called um, OneNote. And OneNote is Microsoft's version of a note-taking app, and it gets a little bit more uh, complicated. So when I, whenever I have meetings, you can see I have tabs here, and then each one of the tabs has like sub-pages. And what's kind of neat about this environment is not only can you type stuff in, but you, you can actually click anywhere and start typing. Um, you can also drop in images, you can do screen captures and throw them in here. And then when you link up your account, like I have through Microsoft, so it's attached to, well, looks like my personal account, any other device that I would bring up this application on has all the same notes available. So if I took notes on my computer and then pulled up one note on my phone, there are my notes on my phone uh, to follow me. So sometimes, you know, I'll go to, um, you know, here and you can see pretty like heated discussions and stuff and we made lists and colored coded stuff and all these rules and whatever. And then I have it all chronicled in a spot. So like when I was getting, you know, trained for this job, for example, I would take notes in here. Um, and I, I think it's kind of a cool app. Um, that's another one that I use. That's another tool I use to keep it straight. Uh, one of my favorites though, and lately, um, they've kind of locked things down a bit and, and is this one. And this is another piece of note, note taking software that I recommend. In fact, I like this one a whole lot better than OneNote, but it used to be that they used a pricing scheme called freemium. So what that means is they give you the software with all of its features for free. The only cost was they would throw these little ads like down in the corner that you'd have to look at. And it's like, well, you know what? That's not, that's not a bad price for a great piece of software that's free. It works very similarly um, to OneNote. It has a little bit different interface, and I think I have the app actually installed. So it's been a while since I've run it. This used to be my number one note-taking app. Um, and for, okay, so I'm not sure. What to, it looks like it's trying to do, <laughs> right, it's trying to like, update itself or something. All right, well, whatever. Um, I guess I don't have it accessible, but I could also log into it through the browser, but it has the same type of interface where basically you set up a bunch of notebooks, you make a bunch of little individual um, pages, and then you put whatever content you want in there. So I always found it very handy uh, to conglomerate information and I would always use it as kind of like my notebook for teaching. So like if I was teaching a course, um, I would write my outlines in there of what I'm covering during the day. Um, but I, a fan, fantastic product. So let's go back to the, the class here and then let's talk about how this works. Now, 
this is not a, a traditional assignment. It's going to look a lot like a discussion board assignment. So I'm actually going to click the title here so you see what happens is this will take you to um, a wiki page. So it says create a wiki page. And then um, you want to follow these in instructions. And the point is, tell me what tools you use or if you're not using any already, explore some and tools you might try to use to keep all the information you're gonna start collecting. How are you gonna organize that and how are you gonna access it later? And so what tools are you gonna use? Now I've shown you three, I've shown you OneNote, Evernote and Google Keep, right? And I guess Notepad++ too, I guess you could say. <laughs> that was another one I showed you. Um, um, but let's say, I'm not sure what to call it, tools for keeping information. And then what I would like you to do in, in this editing window then is tell me what those things are. And what ideally I would say is like, uh, maybe you'd say like number one, okay? Uh, I would say one note, right? So I would maybe list it here. Then I would give a little paragraph. Uh, this is a cool program you know, from Microsoft, blah, 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 you know, so give me a sentence or two about what it is. And then if possible, if you have it running or found information about it, if you can maybe even take a, a screenshot and show me what it looks like. So I'm going to bring up my snipping tool here and I'm going to capture a screenshot just really quick, just to show what OneNote looks like. And then I'm going to copy this. So I'm just going to hit that copy button. I'm gonna come, and, and actually that's not gonna work here, is it? I have to actually save it if I wanna put it in there. So let's just say OneNote, and let's put that on the desktops for easy finding. And then I would come here and I would click this little icon to insert the image, find it in my computer. insert that into the document. And then you can you can actually highlight this and change the size of it if you find that's a little too big, which I often do. Um, and basically the, the whole point of this um, is to get three examples of the tools that you would use. You would submit it to me to earn your points. And then hopefully in the process of that, when you come in here, after you make your post, you should be able to see everybody else's posts too. And um, here's the thing about a wiki. We actually have the capability once somebody else um, has uh, posted something to go in there and adjust it. Now I would ask that you don't adjust it, but I'm just showing you this tool also inside of Blackboard. Um, and so part of, the, part of the thing is to figure out what things you're gonna talk about and the other thing is, is to get it correctly posted in here. Um, and if you struggle with any of it, let me know and I, I'd be happy to guide you. But this is, I think, kind of important for you guys as you're beginning your academic career here at Gateway, is you have some sort of a mechanism for storing and, and I guess almost like curating your information uh, is kind of a good way to look at it too. Um, all right, so I, folks, I'm gonna end this video here. That, that kind of covers all the stuff that's happening in that particular unit. Um, and then I'll open it up to questions. So any, any questions, and at least I see you have your hand up. When you were mentioning that stuff, I use Dropbox every day. Am I allowed to put Dropbox on there? Sure. Perfect. I uh, love putting information on there. It is a great sharing site. Absolutely. In terms of sample stuff. Yeah, that's that's my favorite cloud storage tool myself um you know and and how i i know how you're probably using it to store stuff there but i'm also thinking about like how you're using like where do you go to gather your information is kind of another way to think about this and there's there's many tools out there certainly dropbox can be used that way anybody else questions All right, why don't we do this? Let's, let's take a, a really quick um, like three minute break. I'm just gonna stand up, refresh my drink here. Um, and then we'll come back and dig into some web one stuff.
Thank you very much for Is taking it, the time to answer all the questions I have. Uh, no problem. All right. Uh, just a quick little break. We'll be right back. <laughs> 